Hi, and welcome to On the Spectrum. I'm Larry Walters, and I'll be your host today. Today, we welcome Robert Rodriguez, Public Affairs Specialist for the Social Security Administration in New Britain, Connecticut. We think you're going to enjoy this program because it's particularly helpful for those on the spectrum, and Rob is a real expert in the benefits that are available and how to apply for them. So, Rob, welcome to the program. We're glad you're here, and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Larry. It's my pleasure, and I definitely appreciate the opportunity. So to get started, tell us about the Social Security Administration. What is it, and what does it do? Social Security is the, is the largest social insurance program in the country. Um, it's been around for getting, it's going to be close to 80 years. And basically, we're a program where we assist individuals who may want to retire, uh, individuals who become disabled, people who um, uh, become widowed or survivor benefits. Uh, we also have what's called the Medicare program, and we also have another program that's called Supplemental Security Income, which is basically known as the SSI program. Mm -hmm. How old is the administration? How long has it been around? And tell us some about the programs. Well, it began in August of 1935 under the leadership of FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And in the month of August of this year, Larry, uh, the important thing is that the program is going to turn 80 years old. And I know, I think down in Baltimore, they are planning on having this kind of like an anniversary type of thing because it is, it is a major milestone. And the program has been around for a very long time. Give us some perspective. How many people are receiving benefits and how many people, what kind of dollars are involved? Well, right now across the country, there's around 60 million people that are receiving a benefit from Social Security. Here in the state of Connecticut, as of September of last, of September of 2013, from the last figures that we have, we have around 739,000 people that are getting a benefit. And that translates to $871 million a month mm. that comes in to the state. Now, if you will, we're a relatively small state. So you can picture some of the bigger states like Florida, Texas, and California, and Ohio. So you can just imagine what the impact is. So um, again, we've been around for a long time. And uh, you know, the monetary impact is huge. Wow, at 871,000, that's almost uh, 10 billion a year. That's, that's significant. Correct. And, you know, we do have a lot of money in the kitty. I think people have to understand it's basically uh, uh, it's a pay-as-you-go system. We have around 160 million people that are working. There's a dedicated payroll tax that comes out of uh, an individual's check, and that's basically what it's, what's helping out the system. So there's plenty of money right now in the kitty at this point in time. Tell us about your role and your work at the agency. <clears throat> sure. I've been with the agency, um, it's going to be 30 years. I initially began my career as a, as a claims representative. Uh, but for the last almost 15 years or so, I've been in the role of a public affairs specialist. I go out and give presentations on Social Security. I pretty much can cover it from A to Z. Um, I belong to uh, some different groups within the agency where we go and, uh, you know, double check facilities and make sure that they're spending the money appropriately uh, uh, for, for individuals. Uh, but <clears throat> for the most part, I also do also assist in the local field office. I do translations. I speak Spanish fluently. Uh, so I really have a kind of a comprehensive role with the agency. But my, my love, my true love is, is public affairs and, and going out giving presentations and, you know, talking about Social Security. As a matter of fact, just to tell you, uh, <clears throat> my, mama, my mother gives out my phone number. Uh, people stop me in grocery stores. They stop me in, in, in church, wherever it may be. And I never turn anybody down. So I'm always, I'm always an open book to answer someone's questions. So a real public servant. That's great. Yes, yeah, true. I, I, I've been put in the right spot, so good, I'm good. good with that. Well, tell us about the importance of the program. Why is this a, rel a relevant topic for people on the spectrum? How can the agency help them? Well, you know, um, <clears throat> for those people who are on the spectrum, and when it comes to the, the issue of autism, um, you're kind of looking at one of the benefits that we offer, which is uh, disability benefits. We also offer what's called SSI or Supplemental Security Income, which is also another disability benefit. And I think it's important that uh, if you have an individual who, who falls on the spectrum and, and there's an issue with uh, him or her not being able to be gainfully employed, uh, that they can come knocking at our door to get more information about, you know, how can you qualify? And what would happen is you would end up uh, being able to get a monthly benefit from Social Security if you meet all the requirements. And it's, it's um, on, on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, 
people, people will qualify under di different circumstances. But the medical evidence has to be there that kind of proves that. And, uh, you know, not only do we offer those benefits for disability benefits, but at the same time, uh, earlier I talked about we have retirement program, we have a disability program, we have the Medicare program and the survivor benefits. In the case that a parent either retires, a parent becomes disabled and gets benefits from us, or a parent passes away, one of the additional categories that we have is we have what's called a disabled adult child. And in order to qualify under a parent's record, a person has to have a disability that began before age 22, um, and, and the person has not, uh, cannot be married. So that's one of the qualifiers, and I think a lot of people on the outside may not, may not understand that. And one of my caveats is I tell the person, you know what, don't listen to Cousin Eddie or Uncle Joe. Your best bet is to come right to the agency, knock on our door, and get the information. And we can tell you right there in black and white. What's the best way to, um, to learn about it? I assume the, the agency has a website? <laughs> We do have a website, and our website is www.socialsecurity.gov, and um, it's, it's very transparent. It pretty much, anything we're going to talk about today, Larry, we're only basically hitting the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the website's got everything from A to Z, so, you know, I would encourage uh, those people who are uh, families that are watching this show, you know, visit the website. You can... Uh, get, get, get a lot of information. If you educate yourself more about it, you're going to get a better understanding of how it works. Um, <clears throat> additionally, a person can contact the local field office. And by contacting the local field office, we have somebody who would, you know, talk to you. We also have our toll-free number as well. Are there a number of field offices in Connecticut if a person likes to have the face-to-face -face interaction? Yes, in Connecticut we have uh, 15 field offices. Uh, we're part of the six New England states, if you will, quote, the Boston region. And all of our staff, uh, claims reps and service reps, are trained to answer your questions. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, workers have got plenty of technical experience. Uh, there's uh, great staff that can answer your questions. And we can take a look at what your situation is. So when somebody contacts us and, and says, well, I'm interested in, in, in finding out what's the possibility of my son or daughter you know, obtaining a benefit from Social Security. And we'll, we'll work with the person and, you know, take the claim and, um, you know, explain what the program is. Now, it, d is there a certain office that one should go to as opposed to another office, or does not it matter? Technically, you should visit the office that belongs to wherever you live. And one of the ways in which you can find out uh, if, um, which, is the f which is the correct field office for you is if you call the toll-free number, that, and you give them the zip code, they'll be able to find which is the correct one. Also, you can visit us on the website and uh, go into a specific link that says contact us, and it will say, you know, which is the field office, and you punch in your zip code, and it's going to tell you this is the office that you should contact. Now, as far as applying <clears throat> for the benefits, does it matter if the person starts out on the website or goes to the office? Is one easier or better than, than another medium? Well, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give everybody a tip, okay? Um, one of the biggest pushes that we have is to do things online. And uh, by doing it online, it's gonna be a lot faster. One of the things that we're running into right now, Larry, is that we have people that are coming into our offices, our field offices cold. And when they come into the field office cold, sometimes what's gonna happen is you may have to wait maybe an hour or two before you get a chance to sit down with somebody. So we offer you the opportunity of getting a, a getting, making an appointment but the part of the problem that we have with the appointment is that we have uh, such a large uh, um, number of people that are visiting the offices that our calendars uh, in all 15 offices are like 30 days out. So you can uh, say, I'd like to get an appointment, and you can set up a face-to-face -face appointment, or you could even do it over the phone because we have uh, what are called teleclaims. You don't have to go into a field office. You make the appointment on a specific day and time, we'll take and we'll call you. Uh, but if you do it online, then what happens is and once you press that enter button, then what's going to happen is the very next day or within a day or two, someone from the field office is going to contact you. So now you're beating out that 30-day that wait. Mm. So it's best to start with the <clears throat> website, learn about it, do the initial application, and then if you need to, stop into the field office? 
Correct. Well, sometimes you may not even have to come into the field office because uh, we've kind of changed the methodology in which we work with an individual. Again, you, we could do everything over the phone. Um, so it, it, it kind of makes it easier for somebody because you don't have to worry about gas and traffic and, and parking. And in some places, like in the metropolitan places like uh, Harford or New Haven, you may have some difficulty trying to find a parking space. And there's tons of people that are in the field offices. Uh, try to avoid the first week of the month. Don't go the day after a long holiday weekend. It is um, busy. <laughs> busy, 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 yes. Good. So we, you touched on some of the benefits before. We have the Social Security benefits. You mentioned uh, the Supplemental Security Income, the Correct. SSI. There's also SSDI. I think you said there are five areas. Can you, let's take a step back and break those down for us. And, of course. And how would a person on the spectrum target one versus another? Okay, not a problem. Basically, we have the Social Security umbrella. And underneath that umbrella, we have specific programs. Now we're looking at retirement. We're looking at disability benefits. We have what are called the Medicare benefits. We have the survivor benefits. And then we have, uh, let me see, Medicare, retirement, survivors, disability, and, uh, boy, I think I'm missing one, and the Supplemental Security oh, Income right. Program, the SSI program. So <clears throat> with each one, under retirement, if you will, if a parent has worked long enough, you have to have at least 10 years of work under your belt or 40 credits. When, as long as they've worked and, and they've paid into the system, when they come knocking at our door, uh, starting at age 62 and up, um, we're gonna start to ask them a set of questions. This is how much you're gonna get in your record. And then our pecking order, if you will, we, we always try to find out whether or not there's somebody else who can qualify in that record. And children are the first ones. Anybody who's under 18 or 19, as long as you're still in high school, or somebody who is who has a disability that began before age 22 and they're not married. So this kind of opens up that door. Uh, we also have disability benefits. And in the years that I've worked with the agency, I've seen people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and early 60s become disabled. And if you qualify, then again, that same pecking order comes up. Are there any children? Are there, is there a spouse? Uh, they could potentially qualify. Let's say the parent passes away. I mean, I read the obituaries every single day. I see the age differences. Um, if the parent passes away, be it a mother or father, they paid in, the same order comes up again. You know, who's eligible on that record? And under the SSI program, uh, what we kind of take a look at is if you're 65, you're blind or disabled at any age, and you have to have limited income and resources. So if you have a child who's already 18 years old and they don't have a job, uh, we don't look at what the parent's income is. But if they're, say, under 18 years of age, then we have to take a look at what the parent's income and resources are. And then we also have you know, Medicare, which is the health insurance as well. Okay, so let's take a step uh, deeper now and let's sure. understand a little bit more how to go about accessing these benefits. How do you apply? How do you qualify? Can you give us some, some guidance on that? Well, basically, I would say one of the, things that you, one of the preparatory things that, a, that a, a parent could do is try to give us as much information. Have you been to any doctors or has the child been into any doctors, hospitals, clinics? Are they taking any medications? Uh, the local field office does not make the medical determination. It's actually done by a state agency in Hartford that has a contract with the federal government. They're called the State uh, Disability De Determination Services. They will obtain those medical records. A parent would sign a medical release. We then, in turn, would get that medical evidence, and then they, they evaluate it. You know, um, you know why, can't, why can't the person work? How does your, um, how does your situation impact you? And there will be some additional questionnaires that get sent to the person. Uh, one of them is called the activities of daily living. You know, what do you, what do you do on a daily basis? Do you sit in front of the TV all day? Do you go to work? Do you have any problems with somebody in authority um, who does work and chores, you know, around the house? So there's, there's a, it's, a, it's pretty lengthy. And it takes a little bit of time. It takes anywhere between 60 to 90 days to make a decision. And not everybody gets approved, and if you do, uh, if you do get approved, then you know we'll pay you the appropriate amount that you're gonna you're gonna be done. So the whole process takes about 60 to 90 days from <clears> application <throat> to start receiving benefits on, on each of these programs. Well, 
For every single one, it's a little bit different, but specifically to the disability and the SSI benefits, uh, it could take anywhere between 60 to 90 days. And not everybody gets approved on the first go around. It all depends upon how strong the medical evidence is. And if you do get denied, one of the principal things that I tell the person is, if you get denied, you're gonna be sent the letter. And from the day you get that letter, you've got 60 days plus five days of mail time to, <clears throat> to file an appeal. The main thing is to make sure you file those appeals timely because again, you can get turned down at a second level and then you may have to go before an administrative law judge, which could take up to about a year or so. Is there a certain age that you need to be to, to, um, to apply? No, not necessarily. I mean, if, if you have somebody who's a minor who's under 18, then um, most of the time a parent's gonna you know, uh, put that in. If, if once they're 18, then you know, we consider them to be an adult, but obviously if there's gonna be guidance from a parent that's gonna help out, that's not a problem, we welcome that. Can you give us a sense of what kind of uh, dollars we're talking about in each of these benefit classes? Well, under, under if a parent either uh, uh, retires or passes away or becomes disabled, then that child will get about 50% of whatever uh, the parents, uh, what we call the primary insurance amount. It all depends on the number of years that they, he or she worked, how much they paid into the system. And um, <clears throat> under the SSI program, the maximum right now for, for this year in 2015 is $733 a month. Mm -hmm. But that opens up the door for you to get benefits additionally from the state. So it all, it all depends. But um, under the SSI program, we pay you based upon what your living arrangement is. And now, again, for hmm? each of these programs, is there any kind of restriction on the money that you receive? You have to use it for certain purposes. No, once, once, you, once you get the, you know, the money, the money's technically yours. How you spend it is gonna be up to you. Uh, sometimes a parent may want to say, hey, let's sock away some of this money and it's the, other, let's, the other part, let's use it for some of your daily activities or some recreational things. But it, you know, food, clothing, and shelter can also come into play as well. Now, once you start receiving benefits, mm -hmm. are, is there any um, maintenance or other ongoing obligations that you have to follow uh, to, keep, uh, to keep receiving benefits? Well, that's a good question. Under, under our disability rules, we have, uh, we have what's called a medical diary. So every three, five, or seven years, we want to find out whether or not your, conditions has, your condition has continued. So it's basically like a, it's like a re exam, if you will. So every three, five, or seven years, we institute that. Uh, additionally, somebody who does get SSI every year or so, we do what's called a redetermination. Have you had a change in your living arrangements? Have you gone back to work? Uh, have you, you know, hit the lottery? Have you done X, Y, and Z? And those are things that we kind of take a look at. So when something does change in their circumstances, this could affect their benefits? Potentially, yes. If you get married, if you begin to work, uh, if you come into, say, an inheritance, those are factors because under the SSI program, the SSI program is a needs-based program. So any sort of income that comes from the outside could impact that. So let's talk about work for a second, because that is an, an area that a number of people on the spectrum uh, would want to know about. Can sure. they work and still receive benefits? And, and if so, how does that, how does yes, that apply? Yes, they can. That's, the, that's another myth that's out there, that uh, because you're receiving a benefit from us, that we're going to automatically cut you off. And that's not true. We have, under both programs, under disability and under the SSI program, we have what are called work incentives. And under the... Um, SSI program, which is probably the more common one. Uh, if you go to work, then what happens is the wages that you earn in one month will impact your check two months down the line. But the principal thing is you have to notify us and say, hey, I started working at such and such a place. This is how much I'm earning per hour and how much I'm getting paid every week. Because we then have to put an estimate into the computer. And what's going to happen, Larry, is that that's going to cause payment amounts to go up or down. Now, are there any income limits uh, that would cause them to either lose their benefits or have them decrease? How does that work? Well, some, in some cases, a person can, can earn up to even more than $500 a month, mm -hmm. but it's going to impact your check. It all depends upon, you know, what their circumstances are. I, always, I, I would always say to make sure that you, uh, again, you know, touch base with us and let us know because sometimes the, the dollar amount could be even higher than that. How does that actually happen on a monthly basis? How do they report wages? How do they communicate with them? Okay, good question. Uh, a, a lot of times we'll say to a, a parent, you know, either um, submit the pay stubs 
every month at the end of the month, or if not, we make contact with the employer and, and uh, we can you know, verify that person's wages because again, we're asking you to give us an estimate. We input that estimate and when the, when the month finishes, then we go back and say, okay, how much did this person actually make? And that's gonna determine whether or not the payment's gonna go up or down. And just as a heads up, um, for a parent who is in that situation, you're gonna end up getting a lot of letters that are gonna say, well, you've been overpaid, you owe us some money back. It's all because of the wages. And that's gonna be the main driver that's gonna cause it to go up or down. Is there any limitation on the number of jobs they can have or is it just based on the dollar of wages? It's based on the, on, on the wage amount that they make. So they can get five jobs in a year and we're okay with that. But the main thing is to make sure it gets reported to us. And that's reporting is on a monthly basis? For the most part, yes. If you report on a monthly basis, you're, you're basically a, uh, you're, you're a head up um, in terms of you know, not having to wait. But you have to wait until the month finishes and then go back to check it. So let's say we have a, a new applicant, someone who has not uh, applied for benefits before. Yes. What kind of advice would you give them as to how to get started and take the process uh, through as smoothly as possible? Somebody who's starting for the first time, you right. say? Right, yeah. Well, basically contact us mm -hmm. and uh, visit the website. Um, look at what, try to gather as much information as you can. As a matter of fact, we have what's called a disability starter kit. And the disability starter kit basically has, it's like two pages. It's gonna ask about work history. It's gonna ask what kind of medications are you taking? Have you been to any hospitals, doctors, clinics, et cetera? The more detailed that you have that information, the better it is when you uh, initiate the process with us. And again, you know, don't listen to Cousin Eddie or Uncle Joe. You know, pick up the phone, contact us, because if you contact us, say for example, in the month of January, and we can't give you an appointment until February or March, you're technically protected because you contacted us in the month of January. The, taking a step back and looking at the wages again, because I think that's an area that a lot of people in the spectrum are interested in. At what point will they start to lose their benefits? It all, it all depends upon dollar amount, Larry. Again, if you start to make wages that are maybe like over a thousand and some change, that could have an impact. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know exactly what the dollar amount is, but again, you know, we can. Uh, the local field office can determine that, and they can find that out. Okay, good. Are there any other considerations that a person on the spectrum would need to pay attention to or their family when applying for Social Security benefits? Anything else we haven't talked about? Well, you know, try to be as thorough as you can. Give mm -hmm. us as much information as possible. Give us a listing of who the doctors are, the hospitals, clinics. Um, are there, is there any medications, um, school records? Anything that you can get your hands on that kind of will back up and support what the, you know, uh, uh, what the issue or the concern is, that's going to be helpful. That's definitely going to be helpful. Now, you mentioned uh, earlier our website and our phone number. We're going to repost those again online. Can you just mention them for our, for our listeners? Fantastic, yes. Again, you know, please visit us at www.socialsecurity.gov. And at the same time, you can call our toll-free number, which is 1-800-772-1213. I do want to make mention also, uh, Larry, that we basically have two other things that I wanted to just kind of just highlight quickly, if I could. One of them is... Uh, <clears throat> Starting with in March, March the 16th, we, are, we have new field office hours that are probably going to be a little more conducive to, to the public. And starting in March, our offices are going to be open Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday from 9 in the morning until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It used to be until 3. Wednesdays, we're always going to close. We're always going to be open from 9 in the morning until 12 noon. And what happens is we close our doors to the public at 12 noon because the staff is working on backlogs. We have to have some downtime to be able to work on those issues. Um, <clears throat> By the way, if you wanted to uh, visit an office, is there one day that's better than another? That's such a toss-up. Uh, we've had, um, you know, every day of the week, we get tons of people coming in. I mean, I work in, the New, I work in the New Britain field office, and it's busy. All the field offices experience the same thing. So, you know, you may be better off, uh, sometimes maybe a little bit later in the month, maybe, you know, more agreeable. If you can, you know, try to avoid the first week of the month because that is really, it, it's, it's, it's busy, if you will. The other thing I want to mention is uh, <clears throat> on our website, we have a new, a newest thing, and maybe parents could take advantage of this. It's called uh, uh, My Social Security. You basically go into our website, you click onto this link that's called My Social Security, and you create a username and a password. And what that does, it allows you to tap into your own record. 
Now it's your own personalized information. It's going to give you um, your name, your date of birth, the years that you worked. It's going to let you know how much you can get for retirement and how much you would get for disability and how much your survivors would get if something were to happen to, to, to you. Uh, it's very comprehensive and it's extremely easy. It takes about 10 or 15 minutes or so. Uh, we already have around 16 million people who've set up these accounts. Uh, so we're encouraging people to you know, set that up. It takes a couple minutes. Uh, <clears throat> and for those people who are receiving benefits, the advantage is that now you're able to go in and you can create, you can get your own um, what's called a benefit verification letter. Uh, you can start or stop your direct deposit and change your address. So there's an advantage to you taking, uh, visiting a website and then creating that, that My Social Security account. Excellent. It's great information. Well, Rob, I want to thank you for being our guest today, for coming and talking about the Social Security Administration, the benefits that are available, especially for those people on the spectrum and how to apply for them. And we hope you enjoyed our show today and hearing from Rob about the benefits of the Social Security Administration and why it's important for people on the spectrum to know about the Social Security Administration and the benefits they can get. So please join us again next time. And so from all of us on the spectrum, thank you and goodbye. Turn, 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 not to spend all I want.